Yes, Molly, uh, first and foremost, I wish that you and those watching this interview are well and working together to promote health and safety among your friends and loved ones. You are right. The Liver Meeting is the annual event where members and all hepatology providers and investigators present the latest advances in the field. They learn about newest clinical protocols, where they listen to key opinion leaders giving state-of-the-art lectures and hot topics in hepatology. It is also where they meet with colleagues, make new friends, and really establish new collaborations. So the pandemic really fragmented our plan for the meeting as we knew it, but it did not change our resolve to have the annual liver meeting and to maintain our commitment to the hepatology community, right? So we decided that the liver meeting must go on. The reality is that hepatology remains a vibrant field despite the pandemic. Hepatology has new discoveries and ongoing clinical trials that ultimately improve the health of patients with liver disease. Therefore, we made a series of decisions to turn a challenge into a major opportunity for the field. To start, we gave clinicians and researchers more time to complete their work and submit abstracts. So we delayed the deadline for submission of abstracts. Then we work with the scientific program committee to redesign the entire program and put it in a digital platform in a way that also enabled interaction among the participants. So uh, be aware of the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. We also lowered the registration price so that more can participate in the meeting. So more than ever, we felt we needed to share new knowledge more broadly all over the world. Last but not least, we, did, we took two other steps to make the liver meeting really special. First, we developed new sessions focused on COVID and the liver. And then we invited Dr. Anthony Fauci, a leader who has given consistent advice on the pandemic to the United States to talk about the new development uh, new developments on COVID. And then at the end of the meeting, the ASLD gave a gift to all participants, which was a time to talk with the recipients of the Nobel Prize for Physiology Medicine for the year 2020. They were doctors, uh, Autor, Hawkton, and Price. Yes, biliary atresia is indeed a disease of uh, severe consequences to the health of all children that have the disease. Uh, in the field, we are moving closer to understanding the cause of the disease and to identify new biomarkers to monitor the course of disease, to screen for complications of the disease, and hopefully serve as endpoints for clinical trials. So at the liver meeting digital experience, a group of investigators from my hospital, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, reported their ability to engineer a biliary structure, which he called, which they called organoid, from normal livers and from livers with babies with biliary nutrition. They called it again, multi-lineage biliary organoids. And then they studied these organoids and they found that the epithelium and pedibiliary glands are, are present if the biopsies come from a normal patient. But if it comes from a patient with biliary atresia, the epithelium is delayed and abnormal, and the pedibiliary glands are not very well formed. Therefore, they provide the evidence that there is a delayed epithelial development as one of the main causes for biliary atresia. And then I'll tell you about two other stories. A group of investigators from Texas Children's Hospital reported the results of two studies supported by the Childhood Liver Disease Research Network 
This is a multi-center consortium funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States. In the first study, they reported that children with very good biliary drainage or after the Kasai procedure, which is the initial surgery for these patients, if they have good biliary drainage and low serum biolysis, they have the best outcome. In contrast, if they have surgery, they have good biliary drainage, but if the blood has high concentrations of serum biolysis, they have lower survival with the native liver and require liver transplantation for long-term survival. And in the second study, they actually analyzed a group of patients with biliary atresia, allergia syndrome, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. These are three important pediatric liver disease. And they correlated the serum biomarkers with the stiffness of the liver, the liver stiff measurement. And they found that if they, they found that in patients with biliary atresia, there was a correlation between the concentration of three biomarkers, MMP7, a matrix metalloproteinase 7, interleukin 8, and endoglin are correlated with high liver stiffness measurement. They also found that for allergial disease, this correlation is between interleukin and high liver stiffness measurement. And then for alpha-1 antitrypsin, there was high level of connective tissue growth factor and liver stiffness. So these studies show the importance of discoveries of biomarkers for the specific diseases and that the biology of portal hypertension and fibrosis is not the same, it's not the same at all for all diseases. Yes, Yanchen, you are absolutely right. The pandemic has imposed new challenges in the management of all patients with chronic liver disease. First, there is a real potential for COVID-19 to worsen pre-existing liver disease in a vulnerable population, such as those that have NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with decompensated cirrhosis and those requiring immunosuppression. Even when there is no direct effect of the virus in the liver, the virus may injure the endothelium of the, uh, of the blood vessels and of the sinusoids, causing secondary lesion, uh, lesion in the liver with inflammation and decreased bowel flow. It's also clear that if the patient has very high liver enzymes and bilirubin, which usually means severe liver disease, they are present in patients with advanced severe COVID-19 disease. Second is that the, the pandemic has also had an indirect effect on patients with liver disease. In areas of high prevalence and high transmission rates, the patients have decreased access to care. Sometimes the patients and family members are a little bit afraid to seek help uh, because they're concerned they may get infected. The good news is that hospitals and clinics are taking extra steps, extra steps to keep the environment safe for patients and the healthcare providers. So whenever possible, we recommend that they should delay care wherever they are in the United States, in China, and other countries. They may also not seek care because uh, they may have lost health insurance. And this really shows how the pandemic has impacted different, uh, different socioeconomic status of the patient. Now remember that patients, for example, with some diseases like cancer, they need to be followed because if they're not seen by the hepatologist, the cancer may progress and they may have more difficult outcome. Last is that the pandemic also impacted the patients with chronic or acute liver failure that need liver transplantation. So even when the organ is available, the transplant surgeon and the hepatologist have to make a decision about transplant or not based on the ability or availability of ICU beds, medical and surgical beds. So uh, we are glad that the com community continue to be creative and work together 
to still continue to uh, perform liver transplantations while keeping the patients safe. 